Let us pay heed to this inerrant and fallible word of our God given to us for our instruction in salvation and righteousness. Hebrews 13, verse 17, obey your leaders and submit to them for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning for that would be of no advantage to you. Thus for the reading in Hebrews, turn with me to Romans 13. Romans 13, beginning in verse one. Again, let us pay attention to this word. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed and those who resist will incur judgment for rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. When you have no fear of the one who is in authority, then do what is good and you will receive his approval for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For the same reason, you also pay taxes for the authorities or ministers of God attending to this very thing, pay to all. What is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Thus for the reading from Romans, now to Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, which is the basis of of our message this afternoon, Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Thus for the reading, let us pray. Our great God and Father, again, we come before you asking you to teach us, to speak to us, to bring salvation and sanctification to guide us in how we are to follow you all the days of our life. Renew our minds and strengthen our hands and feet so that we might follow you more clearly, more courageously, more carefully, and more consistently. We pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We continue the law of God given to his people on Mount Sinai this past week as I was looking through some older books that I hadn't thumbed through in a while, which my wife would probably say there's a room full of those. Um, I picked up a book on the Westminster Standards by Francis Beattie, who was a 19th century pastor and then seminary professor after that. I noticed that he had placed the entirety of the law of God, the Ten Commandments, under the section on the means of grace, which is proper. But we sometimes, including myself, just let this slip our thinking. The means of grace are generally defined as the God-appointed means by which the Holy Spirit brings us into communion and union with Christ. They convey, they convey the benefit of that union and redemption, and they're also the means by which the Holy Spirit confirms and grows and strengthens our faith. And the means of grace are normally divided, as you'll find in the Westminster Standards as well, into the word, sacraments, and prayer. Some add other means. I'll leave it with those three primary means per the Westminster Standard. You could look to Westminster Shorter Catechism uh, question and answer 88, if you wanted to look into that later today. But all of this is pointing to this aspect or another aspect even of the law, that the law is a means of grace as they are part of the word of God. And the word is a means of grace. Our salvation and our assurance of salvation is completely 
in the person and work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But as John tells us in his first letter, 1 John, we can look to see if we are staying in the way, the truth, and the life. If we are truly in the faith and not some imposter as we examine ourselves against the word and see if we are living in accordance with the word of God. Obedience and repentance when we are not living according to the word of God. This lets us know that we are in the faith. And so we come to discuss the fifth commandment and we are going to be discussing in general the foundation of the command, the requirement of the command, and then probably much more briefly, the blessing uh, of this command. But we should always keep in the back of our minds, as I've kind of gone through different aspects of this each week, we should keep in the back of our minds several things. Um, We should be looking at these commands as blessings, simply because our God did not leave us ignorant to know what he wants of us after he has saved us, what he expects from those that follow him, not for salvation, but because he has saved us. It's a blessing. But also that we don't follow these commands as those who are under duress, but we follow these commands, thankfully, as those who realize what God has done for us. And these are truly some some fairly simple commands to understand There's some simple commands to follow, but we complicate them because of the continuing struggle with our sinful nature. And then again, finally, we should view them, as I was just discussing, as a means that as we see ourselves increasing in our understanding of the law and following the law, we know that God is at work in us. He is sanctifying us. There is an image, our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom we are to bear that image more closely. And what did he do? He followed the law perfectly. And if we are following him, that is our desire as well. And so for several reasons, we should not want to neglect the blessing of knowing what God calls sin. Another point that I would make too is that understand as we talk about this law, as it really does pertain to many of them each week, um, there will be caveats to things that I say. There will be exceptions that we will want to try to bring up that I'm not going to necessarily address. There are particular questions. Well, if this is so, then what about this? But the point is not that I, I want to become a legalist or I want to try to technically argue for you to do this And to not do that. The point with each law is that we begin to see the truth that we are to follow it and something of what it means. And here that we, that we must honor authority. And then we pray as we continue to walk this Christian life, we continue to grow in understanding what it means to honor authority as we follow God. And one more opening comment. Let us note. As most of us know, I will remind you, if you haven't thought of it already, that this is the beginning of what we call the second table of the law. The first four commands or the first table are directed at the relationship that exists between God and man. The second table is directed at the relationship between men. And in short, that's the distinction that Jesus makes in Matthew 22 when he says that the great commandment is to love is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And then he said, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And an important part of this as we continue to think about the law is that we recognize that without the first table, without the great commandment, but in a, a true saving faith and a love and an honor and a fidelity or faithfulness for our heavenly father. Without the first, it is impossible to righteously do the second. You cannot keep the second if you are not keeping, if you will, the first. And so we should never come, and this is a danger, we should never come to the second table as I think many do, 
Never come to the second table and use that as some measure of spiritual success until you have dealt with the first table. Until you have made, placed God, if you will, it's bad language, but that God is first. He is first above all other gods. And as we think about the progression of these commands, even the, the first table, the second table, we can see that the first commandment of the 10 is, is in effect stating honor God above all gods. Put no other gods before me. Honor me before all others. And here at the beginning of the second table, it is stating honor father and mother above others. A proper understanding in how we are to live in relationship in all of creation begins with this acknowledgement of the honor that is due the creator, having our triune God first in the order of all things. And then in God's order, a proper understanding of how we are to live in this world, a proper understanding of our relationship with men begins with understanding and living out this honor that is due to those whom God gave us to in this world our mothers, and our fathers. And as we examine this command, please do note again and tell your friends that the command is to honor who? Father and mother. Honor, which we can define as esteem and or respect. And it's not just, honor is not just the supposed having of honor, but it's showing of honor and esteem and respect. That honor is not just due to the patriarchy. Honor is due to your father and your mother, even in Old Testament times. Man was created in covenant with God. This understanding again really does underpin what we have already stated about the first table of the law. All men Even fallen men still owe God honor and obedience simply through the covenant relationship that God has with creation and that God has with man. But the second thing to to see here is that God then created Adam. And in the process of creation, if I can say that without scaring anyone, he then made a woman to put into covenant relationship with Adam and with himself to go out and then fulfill the creation mandates or ordinances that we discussed last week that he was going to give to man, be fruitful and multiply, take dominion. And again, as we said last week, our great God is a God of order and we are to honor him. And second to that, if you will, on the second table, he commands man to honor father and mother. And in honoring father and mother, we are honoring and acknowledging this order that God even established in creation. And how fathers and mothers through the covenant of marriage are the primary engines, if you will, of accomplishing the task of subduing the earth and taking dominion. What we find when we understand our covenant with God is that we are trusting him. Our covenant with God means we are trusting him with everything. In covenant, he says, I will be your God and you will be my people. In covenant, God is always doing what is best for his people, even if we don't understand that he's doing what is best for us. He provides for, cares for, sustains. He gives us what we need, not always what we want but it is because he is doing what is best for us. Hopefully we then see the correlation that ought to exist to the beginning of the second table, fathers and mothers in covenant with each other, in covenant with God, and then with the product of that covenant to their children. And here's the responsibility of the parent then to the child. The parent is to provide for, care for, sustain, 
give what is needed for the well-being of their children. And then children, in return, are to honor their parents in the same sense that we honor God. Two points that have to be made with this. One, we have to understand that not all parents are living according to their duties, their covenantal duties. Unbelievers definitely would not naturally be doing this. We are fallen creatures, and therefore all of our efforts and works are tainted with sin. Some parents feel like that providing their children with every possible activity is helping them with their well-being. That is really probably the exact opposite for them, of providing for them and preparing them for this world to give them every uh, bit of their heart's desire and activity. Some parents, oppositely, not only do not provide for their children, but they neglect the nurture and the love that they need to provide for their children. Some discipline too harshly. Some don't discipline at all. And so we acknowledge that all humans upon the face of the earth are stumbling through parenthood. Many, again, we're learning in our 20s what it means to be a parent before we're ready to really do it. But all of us, understanding the covenant that we have with the Lord, we should be working toward this goal of emulating our Heavenly Father in the care and nurture of our children as He cares and nurtures us. But in any case, for the child, the command is for them to honor their father and their mother, and that is the case for you and myself as well. It does not say you don't have to honor them if they haven't been kind to you. The command does not say that they should be honored more if they have done more for you. In the words of the Heidelberg Catechism, we are to show them, period, in any case, honor, love, and fidelity. And we are to submit to their good instruction and correction with due obedience and to patiently bear with their weakness and infirmities. All of this, while we know that they and we have our own understandings and misunderstandings and inclinations and sinful pasts and sinful presence that we are bringing to bear upon these relationships. And so this first point, as we view the requirement, is simply is that we understand that we live in a fallen world And this makes the living out of this command complicated at times. But secondly, we also need to see that this command does just go beyond the parent-child relationship, which is why I read a couple of those other passages as well. This is not always agreed upon by everyone as they read the fifth commandment, but the the historic position of the church and the confessional position that we have and the personal position that I hold, my understanding is that because of the covenantal foundation of this command from creation and really the the covenantal foundation of every command, the idea is that all authority comes from the hand of God from creation and we are to show honor to authority, even if we feel like we cannot show honor, or I should say the authority of the office, even if we don't feel like we can show honor to the person. The fact that we are to show honor to fathers and mothers is clear in Scripture, Leviticus 19, verse 3, other than just the simple command, correct? Leviticus 19, 3 states that every one of you shall revere his mother and father and keep my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Exodus 21, 15 through 17 tells us um, that the, the sentence for striking or cursing father or mother was death. Children that failed to listen to their parents, those that were stubborn and rebellious were to be taken to the elders in the Old Testament and if found continuing in their rebellion, they would be stoned to death by the men of the city. And this sounds harsh to us. But the last of that command from Deuteronomy 21.21 tells us this was done to remove evil from their midst. 
and it served as a warning to the rest of Israel. The sad fact is that we simply today do not take sin seriously enough. And there is some sense in which we are thankful that this is no longer the punishment that is meted out, but it serves as a very real presentation by God to us of the nature of men and of how when we turn a blind eye to sin, when we turn a blind eye to the rebellion of our children, what can eventually be let loose into our societies? And it's called evil in your midst because you would not deal with the sin of the rebellious child. And to reiterate the covenant understanding here, what, what is happening in that scenario that was just described from Deuteronomy is the child rejecting that covenant relationship a covenant understanding of how the world is ordered by God himself. They're rejecting the covenant authority of the parents to do as they are commanded. They're brought before the elders of the city who who at that time represented both church and state. And they were rejecting the covenant authority of church and state. And so they were removed permanently because they had, they had entered into the state where they could not and would not live according to the creation ordinances and the law of God. And so God said, bring the men of the city together and put them to death. That example is also where we see this extension in the Old Testament of the authority of the fifth commandment to those outside of the family. The church has seen this command again as being worked out in the spheres of family, church, and civil. Civil being kind of divided up between vocation and the state authority. And so what we're saying is that scripture describes this parental authority in our family, in the church, in our jobs, if you will, and within the states or governments in which God has placed us. And again, it is in which God has placed us. This is evident from the text we read from Romans 13. But we should also know this from the readings we do normally from the New Testament letters. When we read about the duties between husbands and wives and children, also in our vocations with our earthly kings and rulers, Ephesians chapter 6, Colossians 3, 1 Peter 2, verse 18, just for a few examples. We can also then think of Hebrews 13, verses 17 and 18, which we read at the beginning, when we think of submission to the authority within the church. And this again does not mean that we believe that every authority has our best interest or outcome in mind. It is often that it is their best outcome or best interest that they have in mind. But in all of our activities, within the family, church, vocation, citizenship, we are to be honoring those in authority. And this is where the Heidelberg Catechism is, is especially helpful in our thinking through the how of the honoring. As we honor those over us in each sphere, let us look again to answer the answer in Heidelberg Catechism 104. We're told that we are to submit ourselves to their good instruction and correction with due obedience and to bear with their weakness and infirmities. And let us begin with that, uh, that last phrase because I think it's foundational in our dealings with others, with one another, with those that are in authority. We are to bear with their weaknesses and infirmities. That phrase comes from Romans chapter 15, verse one. This bears itself out in our relationships with our parents. When we become adults, we have our own children, we begin to come to some understanding of something of the weaknesses and infirmities that our parents had when they were raising us. And this comes from seeing our own weaknesses and infirmities as we try to raise our children. We can think that we didn't have a good childhood. We can think that we were mistreated or denied things that we think we should have. Or maybe we come to understand that we were spoiled We should have been denied more in our youth. 
Again, this is your growing in discernment and wisdom. And sometimes we come to see according to scripture, not according to our own determinations or scales, but according to scripture, we, we see that our parents still don't see their own weaknesses and infirmities. We all have blind spots. So what are we to do? We bear with our parents' weaknesses and infirmities, spiritually, physically, psychologically, because by God's grace, we understand and we try to help. Then we realize that we have these same, or not the same, but we also have weaknesses, infirmity, and infirmities that we might not be seeing as well. In the same way, when we enter into the work world, we are going to run across people that are angry or they're controlling or they're reclusive and withdrawn. All sorts of personalities that we come across uh, in the world. And they'll, they'll be our bosses. They'll be our superiors. And we might think, we might know that we are smarter than they, stronger, more capable, but we are to honor them because God has commanded it. He is the one that has put them in that place. Who are you, O man, to question God and why that person is there and you are not? Well, we honor them. We begin to do this by knowing in their anger or their reclusiveness, all of the different issues that they're dealing with their, or they are dealing or not dealing with their own issues. They are dealing or not dealing with their own sins, their own troubled childhoods, and maybe they don't even see what's causing them to be angry. And as we try to bring them the gospel, we try to bring them biblical truth, we remember that none of us are operating at full strength. None of us are operating out of some place of perfect spiritual health. And so we should have compassion as we can have compassion because many times they simply don't understand. And that's how we can begin to honor them in their weaknesses and their infirmities. And as the Heidelberg Catechism states there at the end, it says that God is pleased to govern us by their hand. So we ought to remember that he has a purpose hopefully, or it is a good purpose in the end for why he has us in those positions under those people that we are feel potentially that we don't need to honor. So honor them by realizing that they, just like we, have weaknesses and infirmity that they might not even know that they have. And by God's grace, we might be able to gently lead them to a place that makes them less weak and less infirm and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. With that foundation, then we can go to the previous phrase. We can then, if we have this understanding, we can then submit to their good instruction and correction with due obedience. I would like to flip that sentence to possibly give it a little bit more clarity and state that we are to give the obedience that is due them to good instruction and correction or for good instruction and correction, meaning that there is not an obedience that is due to bad instruction or correction. If our parents tell us when we're 10 years old to go steal candy from the store, if we want some, there is no obedience due that instruction. That is not good instruction. That is sin. But if we just don't like the instruction of our parents or our supervisors or leaders, if we think it's just a bad idea, but it's not sinful, but we don't like it, that is not what this command is talking about. We don't get to determine the goodness, if you will, there. The good of which this speaks is in relationship to what scripture would say is good, or more correctly, if the instruction is not against scripture, just against your own personal opinion of what ought to be done, then their authority given by God trumps your opinion. They are not instructing us wrongly. They are just instructing us differently. And there's blessing that's going to come if you will follow them and honor them beyond your mere opinion of difference. The same goes in church. The same goes with civil authorities. If the elders of this church, I didn't check previous, if we decided to 
to pick orange carpet, to put it in the sanctuary. You might, you might not like it. Kay doesn't. You might not like it, but there is no biblical warrant to become rebellious and create issues because of differences in taste. You just, we're not planning on making orange carpet. There are many ideas that we could, or there could be orange pews as well, right? They have those. There are many examples we could probably think of, but the idea again is that the authority may have a weak spot. Maybe we do see a better way, but when we submit and honor and love are faithful to those that are over us, there is going to be blessing in the end because it's just a difference. It's not that they're asking you to sin. And this is the principle that's presented at the end of the fifth commandment in Exodus. The direct command for them was to honor father and mother so that they would be blessed in the land that the Lord was giving them. The principle is that we are to honor our fathers and our mothers and all governing authorities for they are placed in those positions by God. And as we honor them, we will be blessed as individuals and families and as churches and as nations. We can think of it this way. Those that are disagreeable to their superiors, to their parents, they are generally not going to receive the favor or the advancement or the promotion. They're not going to be the, you know, the, the given first place in the family or the first place at work or the first place in church. The complainers, the disagreeers, the, the critics normally will not find blessing from those that are in authority over them. And those in an authority over them, again, were placed, it was pleased God to put them there. Those that advance and are blessed are those that honor, love, and are faithful to the authority. They can stand before the authority and say, I respectfully disagree with the decision that you are making. And this is what I see as the proper path. This is what I think we ought to do. But if this is the decision that you are going to make, then I will follow you for you are the one that God has put in authority because of the covenantal relationship that we are all involved with that permeates the creation order. God has made certain individuals, authorities in certain spheres and we're to follow them. You have, they could say you've respectfully heard my opinion. A good parent, boss, legislator will learn from that person when they give their opinion and will reciprocate that respect. And in due time, that person will be exalted because of their honor, love, and faithfulness in that covenanted relationship. And I hope we can see this is really in human relationships, simply the description of our Christian life. That is what the Ten Commandments do. They provide the framework. Underneath is just the framework of Christian life. Our triune God is the only true God. There is no other. Have no other gods before him. Jesus is our Lord and Savior. He is superior. Colossians chapter 1, verses five through, or 15 through 17. Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. By him, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. When that's true, when we understand this, we understand our sanctification is an advance in our honor, our love, and our faithfulness or fidelity to Christ. It is giving due obedience to Christ's always good instruction and correction. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And listening to him by his word and spirit and showing that honor and love and faithfulness to him 
by showing honor and love and faithfulness to our fathers and our mothers and all those in authority over us, all those he has put in place is the way and the truth and the life that we are to live because of him. It is the order of creation. When we understand this covenantal structure of creation and the duties that are owed in these relationships, we begin to see more clearly the truth that we honor God through honoring the human relations that he has established. They're not random. He has established these relationships to display his truth. The Ten Commandments are eternal representations of who God is. We've said this several times. They have purpose and meaning that go beyond some mere simple commands. They display truth. They display order. They display who God is and how we are to bear his image. So honor your fathers and your mothers and all governing authorities so that you will be blessed and so that you will be a blessing because you will be blessed. You will be blessed in following God's commands. Amen. Let us pray. Again, Heavenly Father,